Hello and welcome back to Pictorial on Relay FM. I'm Quinn Rose and I didn't go to art school, but that doesn't stop me from learning about art in my own time. And I'm Betty. I'm also someone who did not go to art school, but I also really love learning about art on my own time. And I actually learned, I learned a lot researching this week's topic. So I will now share it with all of you. This week is a continuation of our religious art mini series that we're doing here. Um, and as we said last time, this one is going to be led by Betty. So I will just let you take it away. Yeah, thank you, Quinn. Um, So my topic this week is Christian art. Just like last time when we talked about Islamic art, this is definitely a topic that uh, is very broad and spans across the entire world, pretty much, as well as, you know, about 2000 years or there's there's a lot and what i've kind of done is i've chosen some from like in early periods of christian art as well as kind of through the middle ages and renaissance all the way up until the 20th century most of it is like older stuff obviously it's a lot to cover but we the idea is to just go over some of the some of the some of the works that i think are most interesting anyway uh when it comes to christian art I'm very excited to hear more about this because, I mean, I've kind of made jokes in the past about um, the just sheer number of Jesus paintings that are in the world because I find (laughs) that funny. Um, But I'm very curious to find out more about some of the history behind these pieces and also just I'll say from my own background, I'm not religious, but I did grow up in a Catholic family. And so I have a little bit of background with like Christianity and Catholicism and like, and some of the art that kind of uh, is, you know, common in churches and stuff like that. And so I have a little bit of background there, but I don't really know anything formally about like the history of uh, Christian art and what sort of marker points we're going to be looking at today. So I'm excited to learn more. Yeah. And I kind of, I have a similar experience and personal history I also grew up in a Christian family but I'm like I'm personally not very religious as I mentioned on previous podcasts I had been a gallery guide at an art gallery for um, almost 10 years except not right now because still not able to go back due to pandemic restrictions Um, but there uh, at the art gallery of Ontario we have a lot a lot of European art, which generally consists of Christian art, and like you said, generally consists of many, many, many pictures of Jesus. <laughs> and because, you know, I've had to work in these environments a lot, it's it's one of those things, it's like, you know, I kind of get tired of it at some point, <laughs> um, just because I see it, uh, you know, I see so many iterations of the same poses and the same stories. But it's actually also kind of interesting to see these like Bible stories and as well as Christian history being depicted by different people in different ways. So I think I will get into some of it now. Very quick overview of Christianity for anyone who do not know, which there might be some. Um, so Christianity is um, a very large world religion. Um, it is probably the largest religion in the world in terms of you know, the amount of uh, people who um, are Christians. Basically, it stems from the life teachings and the death of Jesus of Nazareth in the first century. Um, and but it composes it's composed of many branches and different churches. It the biggest groups are the Roman Catholic Church and the Eastern Orthodox churches, which are which were split sometime in in the Byzantine era. And so there's quite a big difference between those churches. Um, and then there are many Protestant churches, and they break up into a lot of um, other independent churches like Anglican, Baptist, Evangelicals. I'm not going to go through all of them because we'll be here forever. But basically, it is everywhere in the world and there are a lot of people who follow different doctrines one of the things i do want to start with is uh, early christian art so um as i kind of mentioned before christian art started in the first uh sorry christianity began in the first century of the common era which some of us call 
first century AD, and that's that is what um, the sort of the birth of Jesus is what our modern ca- calendar is based around. Um, and but in terms of Christian art that we know of today, uh, some of the earliest surviving art dates back to the second century onwards, so maybe about a hundred years after when Jesus would have been around. Most of these are pieces are found in the Roman uh, in Rome's catacombs which is where um, a lot of uh, burial places are and a lot of Christians were buried there and they you know produced kind of paintings mostly for tombs and uh, on the walls of the catacombs some of the reasons these artworks have survived for almost 2,000 years is because it was it's underground it's not exposed to light and it's um, much easily preserved that way this first piece that I just uh, sent you a link of is um, the, it is a story from the Bible. So it is called um, Jesus Healing a Bleeding Woman, and it's a fresco that was painted on the walls of one of the catacombs. And this is a Bible story that's apparently in multiple uh, gospels, like it was in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Um, it's basically the story of Jesus. Um, he was walking around, and then this woman, uh, for some reason, came and grabbed his robe and then he like healed her wounds and it's one of the many stories of jesus like performing miracles and healing people um but the reason i like i brought this work up is because jesus is depicted like a little bit differently than what um we would have normally been used to do you want to give a brief uh overview of what this painting looks like sure well first of all it's not quite monochrome but it's very much all just different shades of brown um is it that's been painted on you have this figure who i can tell is jesus mostly through context clues and he's wearing what looks like a sheet draped around him but i assume is like you know a toga situation um and he's kind of looking behind him and it has one of his arms stretched out towards this woman who is kneeling on the ground and she's draped in a robe um and It's actually, you can't even really tell what his expression is because the level of detail is not that high in this painting. Whether it was ever there or it's been lost to time um, is hard to say. It seems like it's a pretty simplistic thing from the beginning, but there might have obviously been like some weathering over, you know, thousands of years that has also affected the level of detail that you can tell in this and sort of the, the level of distinction and color that you can see in this, which as I said before, is not very much. I, and I said I could only tell this is Jesus basically through context. And part of the reason for that is that I think that in a lot of Christian art that you see, he's depicted with a halo around him. That's pretty dead giveaway for Jesus. Um, and he doesn't have that here. And there's also just like a very typical sort of look that you often see in depictions of Jesus, which you don't have here. I would say uh, primarily because there is almost no level of detail to his face. So he could he could be anyone, <laughs> honestly. <laughs> yeah. You are right, like the details aren't so great on this. However, um, he is uh, in this painting as well as a lot of the paintings in the catacombs that do depict Jesus. Um, he isn't with that typical like long hair that looking like an older guy with beard type of way, like a fatherly figure. Um, he here actually looks more like somebody who's like a younger uh person like he doesn't have a beard he has short hair and he overall just looks more youthful than what uh what we we would be traditionally used to um and so apparently initially when christians were depicting jesus they were actually using just pictogram symbols like they would use like an anchor or uh, like a lamb or a peacock they they would they wouldn't actually draw his face but over time they did they did like draw what they think he looked like and again this is like maybe more than 100 years after Jesus um, existed so maybe these people just had no idea what he looked like and the thing is a lot of Christians were initially Roman and they believed in like Roman pagan religions and so a lot of them just painted what they know so supposedly um, I've 
heard that these early depictions of Jesus is based after like the um, god Apollo, who is typically depicted as like a young man with curly short hair and jesus was depicted in this way for a really long time but then over time so what i heard is that it kind of morphed into some people started using zeus as the reference to depict jesus and zeus is more that like long hair with beard kind of fatherly figure type of person yeah that's interesting and i mean i i am also curious about sort of uh the effects of having more advanced like art technology um in being able to develop like more and more detailed depictions of this figure and also having more and more ability to sort of like spread that idea throughout because i mean like in what what do you say this from the second century like i can imagine like it was very difficult to sort of spread a unified idea of what he would look like or even like depict a unified idea of what he would look what they like interpret him to look like um because at this point he's history he would already be dead even by this point and so you know and obviously we don't have photographs um (laughs) so it's all up to interpretation (laughs) i guess but yeah but i do i i I wonder like how much even just like the ability to kind of standardize it create an image of him uh just kind of changed over time yeah this um i'm sorry i forgot to mention this particular fresco is from um probably the fourth century is from Mm, like between 300 to 350 but it is still quite early and yeah again a lot of because christianity was outlawed for like a couple of centuries at least i don't have the exact uh, dates here um but so a a lot of christians they you know they kind of had to hide the fact that they were christians so their artworks would have you know either been lost or only be discovered in these catacombs Hmm. So yeah, um, I'm actually, um, I'm going to skip ahead a few hundred, uh, by a few hundred, I mean, maybe almost a thousand years because of time. Um, It's because we need to, we need to get to some of the more famous artworks. Um, But what I uh, will show you right now is um, this next, (laughs) yeah, this next work. It it is at Quinn's request that we talk about some stained glass. So we will. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, last week I was like, Betty, please talk about stained glass on your Christian episode. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I feel like if we didn't, it would be, you know, sacrilegious. <laughs> so, like, um, yeah, so what I'm showing you, uh, there's two links. The first one is just... It's an overview of Chartres Cathedral in France, and it is one of the many Gothic churches in France. And I'm using this one as an example um, because it is apparently one of the most well-preserved cathedrals, and it also most of it is from its original construction, which was around 1190 to 1220. So basically, yeah, it's it's well-preserved and it hasn't been worked on over the years like some of the other cathedrals and this this place has has a lot of windows and a lot of stained glasses <laughs> i'm not going to get too much into gothic architecture but basically this is an example of high gothic architecture and um, as you probably notice like these uh, gothic architecture is known for being really pointy like it there's just lots of arches and they're very pointy and very tall and there's lots of um, spires and things like that and then apparently another uh, aspect of gothic architecture is it's quite often asymmetrical unlike roman architecture from before um, which is you know which uh, had a lot of symmetry yeah so these gothic churches and the reason they were building it to be uh, the reason they were using these techniques like pointed arches and flying buttresses was because they were trying to build uh, these buildings as high as possible there was i think some sort of competition to build the tallest church ever and i think this definitely isn't the tallest church ever because you know it was built um in the, the like 12th to 13th century but it is apparently 113 meters which apparently at the time was one of the highest buildings ever and they were trying to you know kind of the idea is to symbolically trying to reach the heavens and therefore trying to reach god the picture that i have shown you 
uh, is just one of the many examples of uh, stained glass that's in this building. Um, if you look at the Wikipedia page I sent you, there's basically on every wall there is there are just hundreds of pieces of stained glass. And we're just going to focus on the North Rose window right now. You don't have to go into details of every single piece because we'll be describing this forever. But yeah, um, do you want to give a <laughs> description of what you see uh, here? Well, it's pretty. <laughs> yeah. I just really like colored lights, guys. That's all you need to make me happy. Um, but okay, so what this actually looks like is it's obviously absolutely gigantic. Uh, sort of the top half of it is this big circle uh, with sort of a with almost sort of, I would say, concentric circles of patterns inside of it um, in different shapes and forms. So you have sort of like, there's the biggest circle and on the edges all around the biggest circle are like semicircles with different patterns inside of them. And then there's this circle of little like uh, almost flower-like shapes. And then there's a circle of squares. And then there's a circle of these little uh, sort of oval shapes. But, and every single one of them is incredibly intricately designed uh designs of stained glass made up of these tiny tiny pieces of glass in between and then underneath uh, the top half that's mostly taken up by this giant circle uh, you have these five what would I call these um, they look like surfboards okay <laughs> yeah. five surfboards pointed up towards that circle and uh, again there I, I should say the colors uh, there's a lot of blue and red everything is very bright this is obviously taken it's a picture taken when the sun is shining in through the glass and so everything is um very bright but again mostly blues and reds i would say with yellow as well um and just a little bit of white and each of these five surfboards uh, has a different image of a person or people in it uh, and you can tell definitely just in the middle you have uh the virgin mary and baby jesus yeah exactly so you're absolutely right. It is really intricate. And um, one of the reasons why there's just so much stained glass is um, stained glass, the technology was developed um, around the 7th century CE, but it was, wasn't was really perfected until around this time in the 13th century. So once they figured out how to make these work, they just went nuts. Um, and Stained glass is basically um, metal oxides that are of different, they're different metals, so they have different colors, and then they are added to the glass or mixed or mixed onto the glass or painted on and then it's put into a kiln and then it, once it's heated to a certain temperature it's permanently the color is permanently fused to the glass and then these pieces are then taken and they're individual, they're Every single piece is individually cut and then they're inserted into lead borders and then they and then it's all assembled into like one giant piece and then they're fitted into the window. So it is a lot of work to make these. And this one is just like an example of it, it just has just so much information and so many like stories as well as figures and people. Um, again, I won't get into what's in all of them but like you said in the center is um jesus, uh, is jesus as a child with mary and then it's surrounded by uh like these ellipt elliptical panels that have like doves and angels and then apparently around that in, in the 12 diamond shaped panels there are 12 kings of judah um they're apparently christ's ancestors and then um there are minor prophets that are in like uh, surrounding that and then and these surfboards like you mentioned at the bottom are of different figures and different um, like different figures do, kind of doing different things like in uh, in the Bible. And apparently um, there's a, the person playing the harp is David. The person who is stabbing himself with a sword is uh, Saul from the Old Testament. Again, I don't know these details specifically, but apparently if you are somebody who studies the Bible and is very familiar with these stories, you can tell from what the person is doing or like the symbols or the way they're uh, depicted to know like exactly who that is and also some of it is like there's text that is like within the stained glass so even if you didn't know like 
some of it actually says like Saint Anne or and so and so so you can um, tell who it is from there um, but yeah it is just it's it's really beautiful and um, the picture really doesn't do it justice like I personally I haven't uh, been to this particular cathedral cathedral but I have been to the uh, Notre Dame in Paris um, obviously way before the fire um, and just these yeah, these things you kind of just have to experience in person because they are enormous and they're, they just tower over you. And, um, yeah, like I would say we should, we should make a pictorial trip to Gothic cathedrals. (laughs) You know, despite a lot, and I mean a lot of the history that goes into them, you can't deny that cathedrals are very pretty. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that's for sure. So let's move forward another couple hundred years to uh, this. So this work that I just <clears throat> I just sent you is from 1499. So this is from the Renaissance period. And so I actually, um, I decided to choose a sculpture instead of a painting. Um, I know there's, there's lots of really famous Renaissance paintings um, like the Sistine Chapel, the Last Supper, but uh, this work um, I think is very unique and I am going to talk about it. Um, So this is, uh, the name of the work is Pieta and it's by Michelangelo and this was actually a work that he did when he was like 24 years old so when he was really young and it's one of the wait 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 we cannot brush over that I'm sorry <laughs> I'm so, yeah, I, I, I mean you know I've heard of this I'm <laughs> I know some things he was 24 <laughs> yeah, I'm I know. 24 <laughs> I know right exactly no i sorry (laughs) i probably should have paused because it is it is a very shocking fact (laughs) i'm so sorry to break up your flow please continue that just needed to be reacted to (laughs) yeah no for sure like um he has uh, i've actually um also i've seen uh, sketches Michelangelo did when he was like 14 when I see them like I it looks like old masters like a you know an old master did them but it's you know a teenage Michelangelo so he was definitely a very very gifted individual <laughs> um and this is an example of that so yeah the, this work is one of the pieces that uh, kind of launched him into like stardom like like that made him like really well known um uh, in Rome and he ended up getting all these commissions to build like architecture and you know paint the Sistine Chapel and things like that so this was a piece that was carved out of one block of Carrara marble um again I the research that I found it says it's just one block so it's not like he assembled a bunch of different pieces it's it was just it was just a piece of rock in the beginning um and it's the scene that shows uh the virgin mary holding the dead body of jesus um after he was taken down from the cross and so yeah like this work by your reaction <laughs> like from earlier is definitely very uh very beautiful and it is the reason I bring it up and the reason it's quite unique is um, apparently at the time it caused a lot of controversy because in this work Mary is actually depicted a lot younger than what most paintings uh, around this time or even before would have shown Mary to be because you know she she has like she her son is in her was in his uh, 30s when he died so she can't be like you know she she has to be you know at least like you know 50 something um but anyway apparently yeah a lot of people were really kind of angry that like she she looks like she could be in her 20s in this in this uh sculpture uh but Michelangelo apparently his explanation is that um she appears young because uh apparently uh if you're a virgin who had a child you don't age that was that was his huh. explanation. You know what? He just wanted an excuse to do what he wanted. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> probably. So this work, like, it is one of the many examples of a, a scene that's been um, painted and sculpted so many times. Um, but uh, this 
pose that Michelangelo uh, has put Jesus and Mary in uh, has been referenced actually over and over again in history up until recently, and I didn't realize this until I was doing the research for this article, which is um, it actually, there is a reference to this painting in Avatar The Last Airbender. Huh. <laughs> so if you click on the link, um, have you seen that show? I have, yes. Oh, okay. So the um, there is a scene where uh, the character Aang falls and Katara catches him and she has him pretty much in the exact same pose as this particular Michelangelo piece. That is fascinating. I love that they were like, you know what this children show needs? A reference to Michelangelo. <laughs> and I mean, not to make this weird, but like, the sculpture is of a, a mother and son and don't these two characters <laughs> date or something <laughs> they do yeah it is kind of a weird it is a weird reference and i'm not exactly sure why the creators chose to do this um but yeah like it it is um choices were made that's right um it, but you know kind of the point is is to show that you know, this you know this work really yeah it really became something that was quite symbolic and a lot of people um really f- felt connected to it and um you know mary's expression and just the way she is holding jesus like it is this very like somber but also kind of elegant and uh but one other interesting fact about this work is that apparently in the 1970s, a Hungarian man who may have been mentally disturbed came and smashed this sculpture with a hammer and broke um, Mary's arm and nose and parts of her head. Uh, it's since been repaired, but apparently that is the reason why if you visit it in St. Peter's Basilica today, it is under bulletproof glass. Wow. I mean, I guess fair enough. So this uh, next painting, again, I'm skipping a few hundred years. Um, It's a painting from uh, the uh, 1800s. It was painted around 1857 to 59, and it's by the French artist Jean-Francois Millet, and it's called The Angelus. And this painting is, um, again, I'm kind of like, I think because I'm used to like all these really stereotypical depictions of Jesus and Mary and the crucifixion, I'm looking for things that are like atypical. (laughs) And this one is a very different way of um, showing religious devotion. Um, Do you want to give a quick description? Yeah, this is interesting. I don't think I've seen this before. This is a painting of two people who look to be farmers, I would say. It's quite a dark painting. Um, The sun, it seems like it's a sunset or maybe a sunrise, but the sun is behind them. And so like most of the foreground of the painting is actually in shadow, which is interesting. Um, But it appears to be a man and a woman and they both have their heads bowed in prayer. In the middle of a field. Yeah, uh, exactly. This painting is an example of uh, the movement realism, uh, which um, was a movement in the 1800s where a lot of artists, they were, instead of painting like noble people and kings and queens and really important people they wanted to paint like everyday people like working class citizens and farmers and peasants um, because you know that's more real life (laughs) than these idealized versions of um, really important individuals but it this painting as well as a lot of work uh, a lot of work that were that was done by Mie and his contemporaries who were painting uh, in this style were hugely controversial at the time because basically uh, the establishment are one they're like oh my god like how dare you like paint peasants <laughs> like instead of noble people <laughs> um and you know uh and you know they're like why are they important um and also people were just not used to seeing a religious uh, painting in this way because people are used to seeing like you know biblical figures but here are just two ordinary 
peasants or farmers who uh, decided to uh, take a prayer. So the, what he is showing is that the reason why it's called the Angelus is that it commemorates the angel Gabriel's communication to Mary that she would, um, you know, be conceived with Jesus. And it is a prayer that at the time the farmers would do whenever they hear uh, church bells um, in the background. And you, you can see in the painting in the very far back, there's like a little pointy building and Ooh. that's apparently the church. So people would like, drop whatever they were doing and they would, you know, have this prayer. And so I think uh, what happened is when a lot of common people and a lot of people who are peasants and farmers saw this painting, they just like felt super connected to it because they're like, you know, this is this is something that they do every day in their daily lives. And um, over time, it, this work actually became one of the most famous paintings, like, ever in France um, because so many people like felt this connection apparently there are some people who say that like when they look at this painting they could like hear the church bells because of you know how often uh, or how like entrenched into their life and behavior this type of prayer was for a lot of people I think it makes sense that this would connect with so many people because there is something about this painting where it's just very clear that this is a small intimate moment in these people's days that they're just like you know they're out there working and they've taken a moment just to themselves uh to have this prayer and it almost feels like we're just kind of a fly on the wall in a, in a small private moment and there's something incredibly intimate about that yeah exactly and for a lot of, you know, religious people in general, but especially a lot of Christians, um, you know, having uh, their religious faith is, you know, a, like a private thing. Like a, for a lot of people, it is um, about their personal devotion and personal connection with God. So uh, I think in a way like this work showcases that rather than just you know seeing a biblical story which wouldn't it would get people to think about um their faith but it wouldn't showcase like what their relationship with um with chris with being christian is so yeah we've seen a, quite a few artworks um but one thing we haven't seen yet is actually a crucifixion scene. So I am going to show you one now. <laughs> Casual. <laughs> yeah. So this one is a, uh, so it's a painting that was done in 1951 by Salvador Dali. Um, it's called Christ of St. John of the Cross. And this is a crucifixion scene, but it is probably one of the most unique and different and from a totally different perspective than what, uh, again, what most people would be used to. If you want to do a bit of a description for us, Quinn. Yeah, this is interesting. So I'll say that, like, as a person who grew up going to church, you know, all churches have usually more than one um, images of Christ on the cross and generally they have sort of a statue of it um and but it's always like a sort of a face on like you're looking directly into the eyes of Jesus it's often usually placed above you as well so you're even looking up at it whereas this is very different but this picture is of an angle that you're actually looking basically down on him um and uh Jesus is leaning forward uh so this is gory, sorry, but his hands are nailed to the cross. That's part of it. Um, and so he's hanging by his hands, but his head is leaning forward. So you can just see the top of his head and kind of the back of his shoulders. Um, and below him, you can see this image of what appears to be like the ocean with a boat in it. What's going on here? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it is very very weird i would say it's quite different um and yeah you're right it is um it's from this vantage point uh that's overhead it's like a bird's eye view almost and to some people some people have described it as it's almost like it could be the 
perspective of God, like Jesus' yeah. dad, like looking down on on Jesus, like from heaven. Yeah. So uh, apparently, so if you are able to see this work like in person in detail, um, they're actually uh his hands there's actually not uh he didn't draw in like nails and blood um and the crown of thorns like basically all the gory details that would normally be in a crucifixion uh painting he actually did, didn't have any of that it's just like the posture of jesus um in on the cross and then um apparently so the way we see it, his arms and the back of the cross do form a triangle, and supposedly that is a reference to the Holy Trinity. He is a surrealist painter, and uh, he was known for just depicting things symbolically, kind of the opposite of the realist, so rather than like exactly what you would see in real life. Uh, so supposedly he painted this work when he was going through a period in his life where he was really like anti-religious and he was an atheist, but then later in his life he re-embraced re Catholicism and he kind of, this was one of his ways of like showing his return to um, having faith again there there is an, another known work where jesus is depicted from above which is apparently this painting uh, or actually there's a drawing from the 16th century by a spanish friar uh, called saint john of the cross which is what this painting is named after so he apparently saw this drawing and um you know was like oh hey like i don't see jesus in this posture uh very often so i'm gonna paint him in this way i haven't found like too many explanations of like what the bottom part is about um but it does look like so again instead of normally when you look at a crucifixion scene there's people below him there's like mary and then there's like his disciples and people who like were nailing him to the cross and uh and things like that are and people like that but here it's like all these people are gone and it's kind of like he's looking down at the world um again i'm not sure what the boat is about but it's i guess another way that maybe dolly was trying to show that uh, it's not just about the crucifixion it, there's like messages beyond beyond it but exactly what it is we are not sure well dolly famously a straightforward artist um, <laughs> yeah. but yeah I will say that my very first thought when I saw this painting that was painted from this angle was like oh this seems like it's you know from the angle of God which is super interesting because that feels very sacrilegious to paint something from like you know the perspective of God that doesn't seem like something that would be like approved of by the church in an interesting way but I think it's a very fascinating interpretation of the scene because like i mean like if you don't know the context of the crucifixion the whole thing is like god sent his son to earth to live as a human being and then die like god basically like had jesus go and die a very painful death for to like save the souls of humanity and so part of this whole thing is that like the understanding of that a father has to sacrifice his son um and obviously you know this is a very deep personification of the idea of deities, but that for some people's faith, that's a very integral part of it is trying to understand this relationship um, and the pain of these like deities slash people as they're personified. And so imagining looking at this scene and depicting the scene from the perspective of God slash the father is very interesting to me. I think because of this, this different way of, of expressing this part of the story, um, a lot of people also are connected with this work. And I'm, again, I'm not sure in, in 1951 what the immediate response would have been at the time, but definitely this is one of the most famous Dali paintings ever. Similar to the last one we looked at, um, the Angelus, where, uh, again, it's showing a different perspective to devotion to Christianity like that one is more about like people in private um, praying um, and incorporating uh, religion into their daily lives and this one like you said is showing what uh, the vantage point or perspective from Jesus's father would have been and so I, I, again, I think because probably like us, like a lot of people are used to um, the same stories being shown in 
you know, the same way over and over, when it is approached from a different perspective, it is, you know, a lot more fascinating to people. Love to see something different. Uh, Like I said in the beginning, there's a lot of different art styles across many different like centuries and around the world. And, you know, today I didn't even get into talking about like Byzantine depictions of Christianity, but I'm actually all I I was thinking we could even do an entire episode on that. So maybe that will happen in the future. There are also some Baroque works that I didn't mention today. Like I like doing research for this episode, I actually had a list of like 20 works and I ended up cutting it down because, you know, oh, wow. we, we're not, we don't do like three hour podcasts. We're just going to stream for six hours. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So there's a lot more works in different periods and also from unique per- perspectives that uh, that maybe we can yeah even talk about on um, a different episode um, but I think through these works I'm showing is um, I'm kind of trying to show like there there are a lot of different ways that people show uh, either religious faith or devotion like it's everything from uh, you know just like a fresco on the wall that we're used to to these like giant the pieces intricate pieces of stained glass with all these intricate stories um to like you know a very beautiful sculpture done by somebody who was you know very talented (laughs) um to these yeah these like private moments and um perspectives that we wouldn't normally think about so i think you know i would encourage um everyone to you know kind of like find uh works that connect with them Well, I thank you for giving me this little tour of some uh, famous art pieces from Christianity, Um, both stuff that I knew somewhat about before, but also like different peeks into some different styles. It was very cool to see different things. Thank you so much to you all for listening to this episode of Pictorial. You can find our show notes at relay.fm slash pictorial, or you can follow us on Twitter or Instagram at pictorialpod. And you can follow me on Instagram at aspiringrobotfm. And you can follow me on Twitter or Instagram at Articulations V, and I am also on YouTube as Articulations. And speaking of YouTube, we also have a YouTube channel for Pictorial Podcasts where we have video episodes of our podcasts. Um, We are a bit behind in terms of uploading, but we will be catching up very soon. So for this particular episode, if you are watching on the screen, you will see all of these paintings over the centuries. Thanks for listening, art enthusiasts.